Dr. Sudha Ram is the Anheuser-Busch Chair in MIS Entrepreneurship and Innovation and a Professor of Management Information Systems at the University of Arizona's Eller College of Business. She's also the Director of Insight, a business intelligence and analytics group working to address social and health-related problems through the use of computational models. Today we discussed her recent AI project that aims to predict which students drop out of college as well as some ethical considerations regarding personal data usage for machine learning. I am a professor of Management Information Systems and Computer Science at the University of Arizona. I direct a research center called Insight, and most of my research in this center revolves around prediction modeling and machine learning techniques for predicting various outcomes. Um, our specific mission is to solve problems in a new and different way, and especially problems that have social implications. So what's an example of a social problem that you and your team are currently trying to address? Okay, so um, we address uh, problems in healthcare and also in education. So I'll explain one particular uh, research issue that is particularly near and dear to my heart. Um, at the University of Arizona, we're a public university, and one of our biggest challenges at any public university is student retention uh, at the undergrad level because about roughly about 60 to 70 percent of the students that enroll in a public university never finish their degree. We at the University of Arizona have approximately an 80 percent retention rate. Um, there are universities in the U.S. that have a 50 percent retention rate. That means one in two students that comes in never graduate. So um, a few years ago, um, when I set up my center, the university asked me to think about how our research could help the university. And when we were looking at the various challenges, you know, funding is a big issue for public university, but I can always predict it's going to go down. <laughs> Do I need to yeah. develop new methods to, <laughs> uh, to predict that? Uh, so we started looking at other issues, and the student retention issue came up to the top. Um, and uh, we looked at the literature in this area, and off late, there's a lot, lot of data available about students, a lot of academic indicators. And so people have started developing models and machine learning methods to predict which student is likely to drop out based on their grades in classes, their GPA, things like that. So mostly academic indicators. But there's a big challenge with that, which is academic indicators are uh, lagging indicators. Students who decide to drop out don't wait for their grades. The grades are only a symptom. They're really not the underlying cause. Uh, a lot of students who drop out also have pretty good grades. So grades are not very predictive. So we decided we want to take a fresh approach. And we also, and prediction models uh, using machine learning are only useful if you can predict them in a timely way, um, which is you want to predict which students are likely to drop out before they even decide to drop out, yes. right? Uh, because once they decide to drop out, there's really nothing you can do. So waiting till the end of the semester, end of the year to predict is pretty much not a very useful prediction yeah. or useful way to do it. Right. So we said, um, you know, so we looked at theories of retention and uh, there are a couple of theories that speak to retention, and they say that students who come to a large public university such as ours, with about twenty, with forty thousand students, um, it, they tend to get lost. They mm -hmm. sometimes don't form good social relationships, and so, uh, so if we can understand how well they're forming their social relationships, and if we can figure out if they've established a regular routine on campus, because often students, you know, don't know yeah. how to sort of deal with their day-to-day -day activities. Mm -hmm. So if we can get signals about social relationships and regularity of routine, those could possibly predict retention. So how do we do this? Um, well, short of sticking a 
uh, you know, device on everyone and tracking them, you know, which is hugely invasive of privacy, there's got to be other methods to do it. So we thought um, we could devise some privacy preserving methods, which also exploit the granularity of data, given that there's large amounts of data available, and use machine learning techniques. So uh, we approached the problem in a different way. We did not look at academic indicators at all. Instead, um, every student at the University of Arizona has something called a cat card, right. which is a card, a smart card that they use uh, for using various services on campus. Mm -hmm. And so we got an anonymized data set. So we weren't able to identify a student other than by an anonymized number. Um, and this data set had uh, the cat card records. Mm -hmm. So essentially it's like a check-in, you know, if they right. go to the student union, if they eat somewhere, if they you know, go into a lab, uh, if they go into their dorms, um, if they use their fitness center, etc. So there's mm -hmm. about 800 places on campus where they use the cat card. And with every, every time they use the cat card, there's a timestamp and there's a location. So we decided to take that and we built these networks of interaction, which we extracted out of these check-ins. Sure. And then we also devised a method where we started to compare their sequence of check-ins to see how regular their sequences have become over time. And so at the end of eight to 10 weeks, we used the measure, various measures of social interaction and regularity of routine and we're able to predict with about 90% accuracy which student is likely to drop off. Wow. And this is much better than using grades because grades are only about 50% effective. Right. So now we're able to predict 90 out of every 100 students that drop out. And we're able to do it about eight to 10 weeks in advance. So we've developed some new machine learning methods to be able to do that. So that's an example. And do you consider eight to 10 weeks a sufficient time to prevent a um, we don't know if that's sufficient yet because we haven't started doing any interventions, sure. but we've talked to the student retention office and they think that that's much better than what, at least what they've had. Yeah, what they've had. That's, that's great. Um, so if we could even move it up earlier, that would be great. Mm -hmm. Uh, but given that most students decide to drop out in about their 8th, 10th, or 12th week, mm -hmm. probably we think that this would be much better than, you know, current methods. As a researcher, where do you draw the line as to what data is too private to use for these predictions? Um, so as a researcher, um, I'm very aware of privacy concerns. I'm very respectful um, and our team always um, files for IRB approval. So there's a process, there's an internal review board. Mm -hmm. And anytime you're a machine learning researcher or you use large amounts of data, um, as an academic, you have to go through your IRB. Uh, when in doubt, apply to your IRB, tell yeah. them what you're doing, and they go through and review your application. And so you have to tell them exactly how you're going to be, what sort of data you're going to be collecting, what you're going to use it for. Sure. Um, on top of that, for projects like this, you have to figure out how to anonymize the data. So there's right. no way you can even identify anybody. So when we do the prediction, we just predict a student that we identify by a number. We actually don't know who that student is. The student retention office has to take that and figure out how to translate it into an actual student. Mm -hmm. And so they'll have to do some connections with their various data sets. So that's kind of the, it's sort of like the separation of the church and the state. Yeah. Uh, so P the student retention office has access to all kinds of data. Mm -hmm. There any way, you know, they can identify students. So when they get our results, they figure out who the actual student is and decide how they want. So we've figured out various mechanisms to preserve privacy, mm -hmm. but at the same time have data that's granular enough that you can actually do a meaningful prediction. Right. Is there any kind of data that right now maybe isn't available to you that would be more helpful with your predictions? Um, if we could get people's permission to get their um, 
any any other digital records of their movement and behavior on campus, mm -hmm. like maybe the Wi-Fi um, records, yeah. that would be even better. Sure. Um, um, you know, that's sense. because there are Wi-Fi hubs in about 8,000 places on campus. With yeah. The cat card doesn't right. cover everything. Yeah. Uh, so if we could get the permission, that would be fantastic because it would give us even a closer, more micro look at these students. Um, so there are two challenges with respect to that. And the first one is the Wi-Fi data is just so enormous uh, because every time you set up a Wi-Fi connection, um, the protocol goes through a negotiation. So for every connection, there's like 20 to 25 different sort of messages that are sent back and forth. Sure. And so we'd have to figure out how to deal with that. So the data is very voluminous. Mm -hmm. That's less of a challenge. We'd have to get, obviously, approval right. to make sure that people don't feel that their privacy is being violated. Yeah. Um, so there's sort of this um, thin line between how much data you can get so that you don't violate privacy, right? Yeah. And so if there's a way to do it, we'd have to figure out mechanisms. The other problem with using Wi-Fi data is the Wi-Fi data at the UVA is being managed by an external company. And so we would have to figure out a way to get that data back, that, yeah. and that might cost us. So we right. have to figure out what the cost is, et cetera. Sure.